here and we are teaching the three breakdowns of a deal live from Southern California in Temecula at the Temecula Market Center with Keller Williams. Um, so this is a class that we've taught all over the, the Western United States for the last couple of months. It is the three breakdowns of a deal. The first breakdown is gathering the information at the open house. The second breakdown is getting that person out the door for the appointment on the phone. And the third breakdown is writing the offer in a way that doesn't make you feel like you have to take a shower afterwards. We have to analyze the way that the yes feels for the giver to give it if we ever want to get a second yes. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about my book, The Machine Gunner's Guide to Real Estate. We're gonna talk a little bit about Zach's book, Getting Off the X, but we're not gonna dwell on that. We're gonna talk 100% about making money. Uh, Jose is one of our new ISAs. He's actually uh, been booking appointments for us these last couple of weeks. We have an ISA program for people that are unlicensed that have started making phone calls for us all over the country. Um, my sister, who's a combat vet, started with us yesterday and booked her first appointment. We had two people that have started within the last week that have both made uh, over $300 already in booking appointments for us. So the way that we're doing things, it's work-based. People don't like to work in this industry for whatever reason. The path to success, there is no path to success that does not lead through hard work. And so that's 100% we're talking about here today. We're talking about dialing, we're talking about open houses, and we're talking about getting out and showing properties, the things that people don't want to do. So um, I'm not going to hold you guys up any more here right now. I'm going to introduce you guys, uh, my sales team lead, the guy that I have been recruiting, our number one agent in his first year for sales volume, number two in commissions for 2017. And he did it in his first year, made over $100,000 with the server team at KW. Uh, we weren't at KW yet. Now we're at KW, we're ready to rock and roll. So uh, Zach Bach, uh, United States Air Force veteran, salsa dancing spy. Uh, and Zach, if you want to give everybody a little bit of an introduction, and then I'll, I'll start talking about open house. So I've been in sales a long time. It started with Boy Scouts. Uh, so seized candy and popcorn, pop, pop in my region, and seized candy and popcorn. I uh, worked at Office Max, top of my region, and extended warranties, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, pretty much every sales job I've had. Uh, you know, it's not that sales that comes naturally. To me, it's that I can just talk. I just talk until people buy it from me. Is really what it comes down to. So um, we're going to go over a lot of stuff today. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. The thing is, is uh, I read a book called The Slide Edge, and one of the, the things that he talks about the slide edge is that we don't have an information problem. We have an application problem. We can give people all the information in the world to make them billionaires, but most people are not going to apply that information and actually take and apply what we teach them um, to be successful. So um, I'm going to cover a couple of things. Uh, the first one is called get it off the X. One of the things that we had to do is when we drew our gun, we, we stepped. We stepped left, we stepped right. Why? Because there's an X at my feet, and there's somebody over there that wants to kill me. Now, I have an X here that I need to get off of or I'm going to die. All of us have an X in life. Okay, and you have to identify what your X is. What is the thing that you're afraid of? What is the thing that's going to cause you to fail? I'm going to go to Justin because I know that he's going to give me an answer on this one. What is your X, Justin? What am I afraid of failing in? Yeah, what, what is it? What's the one thing that's, that's stopping you, and you know it's stopping you, from unlimited success? Uh, I guess a fear of capital investment for me. Okay. So it's, that, it's, it's the fear of basically putting skin in the game. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. What about you, Jamal? Not even real estate, brother. Oh, what is the what's around. what is it in life that's causing you to? I, well, I fear not succeeding for my family. So it's a fear of failure. Yeah, is really what it comes down to. Okay, okay. Dan, the real estate man, what do you got? I, I echo that. Fear of failure. Okay, okay. What do you got, cowboy? Fear of failure because my family, my brothers, have always told me I wouldn't have. All right, so it's that you've had you've had that ingrained in you. You've had brother, older brothers, I'm assuming. Older brother, okay, brother. okay. So you're the middle you're the middle child. Okay, so you're Martha. Okay, or Marcia. Is it Marcia from the Brady Bunch? Marcia, Marcia, Marcia. All right. What do you got, Jose? Uh, they need to stop procrastinating. Okay. So much. So you got to stop hitting that that snooze button. I'm gonna talk about that. All right, Leticia, what do you got? I'm afraid of failure. Okay. And rejection. Failure and rejection. Rejection's a hard one, right? Getting getting past that no, getting past that. That person getting mad at you, getting past that person in La Cresta who's completely unwilling to, to work with you, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit. So who knows the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? Intrinsic versus extrinsic 
intrinsic motivation. Okay, intrinsically motivated people are the people are like, I just, I get up and I'm ready to rock and roll and life is, and I get life and let's do it and, and I, I don't need any motivation from anybody. That's a lie. It's a lie. There's nobody truly intrinsically motivated. There is an extrinsic motivation and that's your why. It's why you do things, okay? If you have kids, that's a good why. If you were raised in a double wide mobile home in a trailer park and you really don't want your kid to be there, that might be your why. You have to figure out what your why is and then remind yourself daily of that motivation. So the last thing I'm going to, I've shortened this a lot down today because you have a lot to cover. The last thing is, is I want to talk about alarm clocks. I truly believe that alarm clocks, but more specifically, the snooze button on an alarm clock is the worst invention ever in the history of mankind. And this is why. We will set our alarm knowing that we, we need to be up by 7. We set our alarm for 6.30. And then what do we do? Boop. Oh, I just want to lay here for 30 more minutes. Boop. I want to lay here for five more minutes, but I'm going to pull up my phone. I'm going to scroll Facebook. I'm going to look at Reddit. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that on my phone. What would, what, how much work would you accomplish in the morning if you got up at 6.30? Right? That 30 minutes. Now, the first day you do it, it's not going to amount to much. But over 360 days, give you 65, over 360 days, how much will that 30 minutes amount to? Hours upon hours of production of not going to Starbucks in the morning, of making your own breakfast, of doing this and that, of not having Jamal make fun of me for coming in with McDonald's one day, okay? Wow. Right? <laughs> if I had woken up 30 minutes early, I would have time to make my food for the entire day. So everything that we're going to teach you is about a shift of mindset. It's about scheduling. It's about creating a structure in your life. And on that, you ready? I'm ready. Hey, super server? I'm ready, brother. All right. So, um, so if you want to uh, interact here with, with people, um, you can either do it live on your deal, but you can pin people's information there. This is fancy. So all you do is gotta, you just click show, and then you can put top comments on there. Okay, guys, so what we're going to do is we're going to jump in um, with uh, – we're going to jump into the open house script. The open house script is my bread and butter. I made over $120,000 in my first year in real estate without getting a single lead from a team lead, without getting a single softball – Without door knocking expires, without any of that crap, I made over $120,000. Um, so what do you need to do in order to be extraordinarily successful at working open houses? Work open houses. It really is as simple as that. We over the complicate the heck out of everything. Um, for, for an example, and why don't we just go and start here? Because I'm one of those people that I like to start with the end goal in mind so that you know exactly what you have to do to get there. Can I ask a couple people here that what is your annual, what is your goal this year? Can you ask the people at home too, what is your goal and then pin mm -hmm. that? What's your goal for 2018 financially? Gross 500. Gross 500,000. That's a good goal. What's your goal? Uh, 100,000. 100,000. Good. Let's increase it a little bit. What about yours? I just 35 homes. 35 homes. It's an interesting number. Why 35? Because you got put on the spot? <laughs> All right, right on. Good answer. What about you? What's your, what's your goal? Hundred thousand. Okay, cool. I'm Guys, I love that. I don't want to get too ambitious. What's your goal, sir? Goals two fifty. That's a good goal. What's your goal? Um, get my license right away and hundred grand right at the door. And you're already getting paid, and you don't even have your license yet. No. Right on. We got one more appointment to, to make, right? Okay, so guys. I think that for the most part, pin me a new que a, a new question because Jennifer's question has been up there for all like for like fifteen minutes. Um, what is your goal? Type it. What is your goal? And then pin it. This is this is the way. So we're, we're rejection is hard. That's why we work together as a team. What is your goal? Show. Bam. Oh, yeah. We're learning this new tech together. I appreciate all of you guys being willing to sit through it uh, <laughs> for us for the first time. So I look at goals, and I think that most times goals are way too freaking low. Way too low. What happens if you fall short of your hundred thousand dollar goal? You're gonna be pretty disappointed. Yeah. And how much money will you make? Eighty thousand, fifty thousand, sixty thousand bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Our goals suck. Our goals absolutely stink. And so what we do is we plan from the beginning to fail. That's why our goals are so low. What if I told you that you could make a million dollars this year? If I, if I could quantify that for you, and if I could put it in hardcore numbers so that 
so that I could show you exactly how you can make a million dollars this year. Is that something you might be interested in? Of course. Let's do some NLP. Is that something you might be interested in? Yes. yes. Okay. So it's as simple as this. On a crappy split in a decent price point, your average commission is about 5000 right? On a decent split, $5,000 commission. Is there anybody who split grosses them less than 5000 Anybody? Okay. About 5000 If you held... And I think that the mega open house is a lie. The mega open house is a lie. It does not exist. There are not 120 people that are going to walk in through an open house in Temecula. There are not. I sold the oldest house in Temecula. The oldest house. It was the coolest house out there. We did not get over 100 people. Are you freaking kidding me? It's a lie. We're being sold it. It's being force fed to us. It's garbage. Okay. If you can get, can you convert one person every three hours? One person, even at a crappy open house where you have five people show up, can you convert one person every four hours or every three hours? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Justin. One person every three hours. If you held 12 hours of open houses a week, 12 hours of open houses a week, three four-hour open houses, and you converted one person, one, every three hours, you make $1,020,000 this year. Welcome to the class. Hello, everybody. $1 million this year by working 12 hours of open houses and converting one person every three hours. But no one is willing to do the simple things extraordinarily. No one is willing to do the simple things extraordinarily. If you could quantify it, you could say, if I convert one person every three hours, I will make a million dollars this year. All of a sudden, that seven-figure goal seems a little bit more realistic, right? Okay, now if we fail on a million-dollar goal, and we hit 650,000. Not mad. Not mad. That's my point. You fell on a hundred thousand dollar goal and you get 65% of it and you get 65,000. Pretty freaking disappointing. All right. Okay. This guy made over a hundred thousand dollars in his first year in real estate. I made over a hundred thousand dollars in my first year in real estate, not on the team. You're in the right room. Let's rock and roll. Cool. Okay. Now, what are your goals? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody ready to increase some goals? Okay. Uh, all right. Here we go. So the first thing that I like to do when people walk into an open house is I like to let them into the freaking open house. Is that weird? Most people, they hold the open house hostage. They force people to do what? Register. What? Register. And they tell them what? So I can show my own homeowner who's coming through the house. I need, for security reasons, can you please sign into the open house? It's garbage. It's a lie. It starts things off in a, a distrustful way with your new clients. You do not have to do that. You do not have to lie. What if you just let people into the open house? Holy smokes. It might be okay. I promise you that. Because this is what happens. You walk in, you hand them three flyers. From your agent flyer which has a bunch of information about you personally as an agent. I learned this from bald guy, Red Tide, John Butler. Give them your meet your agent flyer. If you don't have a lot of stuff, like if you're a new agent, talk about how great Keller Williams is. If you're a new agent on a team, talk about how great Justin is. Welcome. You don't have to tiptoe in. You can just come right in. Um, give them your meet your agent flyer. The second thing that I like to do is I like to partner up with other people that are also holding open houses so that I can send these clients to other listings that are currently open right now to an agent that I trust rather than having them drive around and look at other open houses that I can't control. I want them either looking at other open houses that I can't control or I want them going home. Who oh, welcome. Come on in. Um, so number three, of course, is the lender uh, the, the lender thing. You want them to be able to reach out to a lender. Okay, so they walk in. The first thing that you do, let them walk in through the door. Hey, come on in, guys. Uh, this is a little bit about the house. These are some flyers about me. The house is 2,320 square feet. Uh, there is no HOA here. We got to pull out back. And if you couldn't tell from the curb, this is a single-story home. So come on in. Take a look around. Let them in. Let them look. It's okay. Because what you're going to do is you have to let them look at the house so that you could find out the compelling reason. They can't give you the compelling reason until they have something to compare and contrast it by. And if you will not let them walk in through the front door without giving you their information, they're going to give you some bunk information. Right? Or they're just going to say, no, I have an agent. And I have an agent is code word for 
leave me alone. You cleaned it up very drastically, and it's because you're wearing a cowboy hat. If I would have said it, I would have had to bleep something out. So I'm glad that you jumped in there. Okay, so they walk in. Hey, guys, come on in. 2,320 square feet. It's a single story. There's a pull out back. Uh, feel free to take a look around. Let me know what you guys think. Let them into the house. They walk around. And this open house is full of what? What have I brought with me? Oh, listings. Listings? Did I bring a bunch of cookies and brownies and lemonade and pomegranate juice and a, a professional masseuse and professional chef and all these different things? Guys, we lose our minds as real estate agents. We absolutely lose our minds. We start talking about like, oh, every open house that I walk into, I like to bake cookies. That way the whole house smells like cookies. No one has ever bought a house because it smells like cookies. Not one. Not one time in the history of mankind has ever has anyone ever bought a house because it smells like cookies. So stop losing your mind. Stop giving away lemonade. And the other thing is, is stop giving three- and four-year-olds cookies and then letting them walk around your client's house. If you're going to put them in a situation where you have to control somebody else's kids, you might be putting yourself into a bad situation. So we don't give away food, we don't give away brownies, we don't give away anything but bottled water and value. Bottled water and information. Come on in, take a look around, you've got the flyers in your hand, and then immediately you start figuring out who they are, what they're looking for, where they have been that day, and you start looking at visual indicators. Visual indicators are things like if somebody walked in with an LA hat on, if somebody walked in with a cowboy hat on, Right? If a mom walks in with three kids, if somebody walks in and they've got an animal rescue shirt on, right? There's a million different conversations that you can go into based on what they are wearing, based on how exasperated the man looks when he walks in. If he walks in and he looks exhausted just to freaking be there, my favorite question is, you guys out running the open house circuit today? I want to get him feeling exhausted immediately so that by the time that he walks out, He's ready to talk to me because he knows that I'm going to save him some time. Man, you guys out running the open house circuit today, brother. You look exhausted. Are you okay? Do you need a hug or something? And he's like, oh, what are you, four, five? Four or five. This isn't your first day either, is it? No. No, it's not. Camaraderie, right? Mirroring and matching, okay? NLP, Neuro Logistic Programming. Anybody know what it is? It is a way for you to become a Jedi. Get anybody to do what you want them to do at any time based on body language, the way that you, you are using your voice, giving them visual indicators, picking up on their visual indicators. If I was sitting at a listening appointment with Jose and he was sitting like this, I would sit like this, right there with him, mirroring and matching. People want to work with people that are familiar to them or people that are somebody that they want to be, okay? Come on in. Take a look around. Let me know what you guys think. Yeah, you guys out running? You got a question, brother? Hit me with it. So when, when, do they, when do you get their information? I don't get their information. I just bank on them calling me eventually. Right. <laughs> I just give them my business cards, and I'm like, if you guys might need an agent sometime in the future, give me a call. No, come on. So what we do is we let them walk in. They're going to go. They're going to look at the open house. They're going to fall in love with it. Get over here. Come in. It's okay. You don't have to freaking stand in the hallway. Okay, so... So what they do is they walk through, they either fall in love with the house, that 5% of the time that that happens, or they realize that the house is not for them, the other 95% of the time. And then when they walk back, you ask them one question. So what'd you think? So what'd you think? And the first thing that they're going to do is what? They're going to say what? Yes. And they're going to give you an inaudible, strange noise. Welcome to the class. Um, so what do you guys think? <coughs> the visual, uh, that, that verbal, like, the uh, that's what you want, okay? Because then you're going to follow it up with, not exactly what you guys are looking for, huh? It's not exactly what you guys are looking for. It is okay not to sell that house to them. That's okay, even if the homeowners are listening, listening to you. Less than 1% of agents have ever sold an open house at the open house. I'm not going to tell you how many times I have done it, but I will tell you that eight people on my team, not all of them are here anymore, have hold a, uh, sold an open house at the open house. That was more than half of us at one point had sold an open house at the open house, which is a lot different than 1%.
okay? And it's because we're not shoving anything down anyone's throat. We're not forcing them to buy it. So what do you guys think? Eh. Okay, not exactly what you guys are looking for, huh? No, not really. Then you have to find out what they are looking for. Come on in, guys. Feel free to fit in wherever. Um, but as they come in, so what do you guys think? You start picking up on these things. Now you are looking for their compelling reason, but you're going to get it as they're giving you the, their, their information based on the contrast of what they didn't like on this last house, right? The three things that you may have to do to provide value to prevent a walkout, which is this, because they've seen the house now, right? And that's what you're worried about. And most men are going to do this if they've seen the house already and they don't want to talk to you. I have an agent. Right? And they just want to walk out. They don't want to talk to you. That's okay. So there are three different things that you can do to provide value to anyone to get them to stop dead in their tracks. One is very obvious. Women, what is the most important thing to you in the world? Children. Children, right? Most women are looking at their house and they're thinking about their kids already. They're thinking about the kitchen. Yes, ma'am, that's where we're making the decisions. But what we're thinking about is our kids. So schools are important, right? If you're looking in French Valley, how many different school districts are there in French Valley? Major school districts. Three. And you could make a case for there being a fourth because it's Paris High School, right? That's four different high schools that are available to people in French Valley. Murrieta School District, Temecula School District, Menifee School District, and even Paris Unified. Four different school districts within three miles of each other, within two miles of each other. You think women might be interested in that? Yes. That's right. That's right. Okay. The second thing is for men. Garage. You're, you're thinking about the house itself. What what are men more interested than than, than in any of them? Taxes. Their taxes. Justin, you've been doing this for a minute, brother. Okay, so freaking the taxes. The best thing that you could do for a man who's walking out and said, ah, I'm an agent. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a second because we never want to poach another uh, agent's client. But that's typically code word for I'm not getting enough value from you yet. Okay? So, uh, uh, has anybody talked to you about taxes? Uh, why? Right? That's a typical word. Why? Okay. Well, just in this neighborhood right here, this house right here is at a 1.3% tax rate at 400000 which is going to be about $5,200 annually. But you go a couple of streets over that way, it's at 1.9%. You go across Winchester Road over that way, it's at 2.2%. So for a $400,000 house at 2.2%, that's $8,800 annually. At a 1.3% tax rate for the same exact house at 400000 that's $5,200 annually. That's $3,000. Six hundred dollars a year that you would save in taxes three hundred months by looking in areas with the lower tax rate. Does that sound like something that you might be interested in? Probably, right? So for men, it's taxes. For women, it is schools. And then the other thing that you could do to provide somebody with value right now to get to get them from to prevent them from walking out before you've had any of these conversations is what can they see right now? I always would print off. We'll put it in your iPad, the 75 to 100 closest listings. 75 to 100. I like to print them off because I uh, I just hate I, I hate Mother Earth so much, so I just really want to print off a bunch of paper and be destructive. No, but uh, what, what I really want to do is I want to give people as much value as I possibly can. So I'm going to print off 75 to 100 of the closest listings, and I am going to green tap with little green stickies. Everything that is vacant, go direct. I'm going to yellow tap everything that is a two-story. I'm gonna blue tab everything with a pool. I'm gonna red tab everything that is notice of default, short sell, foreclosure. I'm gonna organize it all in price. And then if somebody's getting ready to walk out through the front door and I say, you know, I have 78 of the closest listings all printed off right here and organized by price. What are you guys looking for? Maybe I can save you guys a little bit of driving. What do you got there? I've got 70, 78 of the closest listings uh, I printed this off this morning, so they're all active. Um, everything that's green is vacant, go direct. Everything that's blue has a pool. Everything that's red is a notice of default or a short sell or a foreclosure. They're all organized by price. Do you think that they might take that stack of paper from you? Heck yes. And then what do you think that they're going to want to do? They're going to start looking through it. 
It's organized by price, right? What are you guys looking for? This is one way to do it. What are you guys looking for? You're looking, oh, we're looking for a single story. Now, what were you doing when you were putting together all this stuff and organizing it by price? You were looking and studying your inventory. Okay, well, everything with the purple tab is a single story home. And everything with the blue tab is actually uh, has a pool. And then everything green is vacant go direct. So I can actually show you any one of those houses that are green tabbed today at four o'clock after I sh shut down my open house. Oh, cool. All right. Now, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to be cool with it. They're going to be ready to, for you to move into the closing script. Or they're going to try to take out one or two and then walk out the front door with it. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Those are my only copy. Those are one of the copies. I printed that all off this morning. But if you want to go ahead and give me your email, I could go ahead and send you those listings. Go into the closing script, which I'm going to teach you guys here now. Okay? So all of these are, everybody wants to talk about the perfect script that will help you convert 100% of the time. And most of the time it is built around stupid things like name sandwiches. Jose, what if I told you that I could find you the house that you're looking for, Jose, for under $400,000, and it might be something that you and your whole family are going to love, Jose? What do you think about that? That'd be great. You want me to look at it? You know what I mean? Like, come on. Like, it just doesn't sound like we're even human beings anymore. It's like embarrassing, right? So all I'm doing is I'm teaching you three ways that we can provide value. And then I'm going to teach you the closing script. The closing script is word for word how we're going to rock and roll through this. Okay? So what are the three ways that we can provide value? And hello to the 24 people watching at home. Let me know if you guys have any questions and we'll rock and roll with those as well. Um, what are the three ways that we provide No, that's okay. You don't have to apologize. This is pins. We're all looking at each other off, rock and roll. Hey, okay, so hit me with it, brother. If you're doing 75 to 100, let's say you are out in Manchester or you've got, you know, different cities. Are you going to different cities and pulling 75 to say, hey, these are ones you can these are in Marietta? You, you absolutely can. The only reason why I don't do that is because if you, like, enough so I hold all of my open houses open from 11 to 3 when I was holding open houses. That way I can sh I can show at 8.30 the next morning and at 4 o'clock that day. Because you do not want them walking out of your open house and going to another open house. You don't want them walking out of the, the, your open house and going home or going to a new build. You want to give them something that you can give them of value so that you can say, go home. Go watch a movie. Go get some lunch. You don't want to drive around and look at 75 houses that you hate. Look at you. You're already exhausted. Take this guy home. You guys have some lunch. You guys relax. See me at 4 o'clock. Let's go look at some houses that you guys actually want to look at. You know what I mean? Get them to go home. You don't want them out there talking to a bunch of people like Zach. Because <laughs> Zach will do it. Everybody says that they don't like a salesperson until they meet a salesperson. Everybody doesn't want to be sold until they until they get sold. And so you're either <laughs> going to do it or somebody else is. Okay, so this is the closing script. Um, yes, ma'am. So I always do about three to five miles um, because, I mean, if you're in Winchester, if you're, if you're in French Valley and you do 75 to 100 of the closest listings, that's like three or four miles. That's how many damn houses there are all the time. If you go outside of that, it's a little bit harder to pick up all of your open house signs and then get over to the to the house by four. Mm -hmm. You can always sell somebody on Temecula. You can always sell somebody on Menifee. You can always do those different things at the appointment. The point is to get them to the first appointment because until you get them out the door for that first appointment, they're just a prospect. They're just a prospect. They're not your client. They're somebody else's client until you freaking get them out the door for the, oh, it's speaking of somebody else's client. I want to talk really quick about poaching clients, and then we're going to jump into this to this script. This is like when somebody walks through and they say, "I have an agent," which is code word for "shut up." I'm not getting enough value for you yet. Um, they know what they need to do to tell you to shut up. If somebody actually has an agent, I have no interest whatsoever in poaching them, but I still want to help them out. I still want to tell them about taxes. I still want to tell them about schools. I still want to tell them about 75 to 100 of the closest listings. I don't want their information. But if I could hook up your client and I could tell them about the perfect listing that is open for them that I know about because I'm so fanatic about my market, they go, they fall in love with it, it's open, they call you, 
you write an offer and then you didn't have to fill up your gas tank that weekend and you got a weekend back with your kids. Justin, are you going to call me up and are you going to hate me or are you going to be like, hey, sir, but thanks for hooking up my client, brother. We're freaking, we're sending you guys over an offer. Yeah. Or we're sending these over other people over an offer. I don't have to get paid this time. I want to have a good reputation so that when Justin is in a multiple offer situation and he's listed in his house, I send over an offer and I'm one of the faces in a fray or Zach sends over an offer, one of the faces in a fray. But because I hooked up his client six months ago, he remembers that crap. And he says, hey, David, this is what you got to do to beat it. Reciprocity. Win, win or no deal. I'm not interested in poaching clients. I'm 100% interested in helping every single person that walks in through my open house find the house that they're looking for. Period. Cool? So somebody walks into the open house, they do the thing. So what do you think? Value adds. I don't like to go into the three value adds unless I have to, but they are something that, uh, so who, where are my, uh, everybody here take a disc test? Yes, sir. Are you an I personality or an S? DI! You're a hard driver, freaking dressed up as an I personality. I can respect that about you. What about you? I'm a DI. You're a DI too. I'm a DI as well. So DIs, we have no problem. We don't need the three values. <laughs> we just want the closing script. Where are my eyes? He's an I, but he prays around like a D. Okay, so I personalities typically love to talk. They feel bad about being in sales. They don't want to sell anybody anything. They don't want to ask for an email. They don't want to ask for a phone number. They feel bad. That's my I personality. They'll talk to somebody for three hours in their open house, and then they won't get the information. Okay, so what we want to do is, are, are you a D? Are you an I? Uh, DC. DC? That's an interesting mix. Right on, okay. I don't know. DI that makes a little more sense. DC, an organized hard driver. Your wife must love you. <laughs> okay, so uh, so what, what we want to do is once they walk through, once we do the whole value add thing, they come through and we say to them, uh, they walk through, we want to find out what they're looking for. So we are asking questions that are important. We want to find out what square footage they're looking for, how many bedrooms they want. We want to find out what the price point is that they're looking at. But how, do, how are we asking for the price right now? How are we asking people what they want to spend? I love you right now. What are you looking to stay under? I always say, what are you guys comfortable keeping it under? Because that says to them, I respect your budget. A lot of people say, what are you guys approved at? What do you guys approve up to? What's your max? Don't ask people about their max budget. Ask them what they're comfortable keeping it under. If you ask them what they're comfortable keeping it under, that's a that's a budget that, get, that they can respect. The other thing that you need to ask about is schools, but you don't want to ask a woman, where does your kid go to school? Right. right? You say, are you guys currently in Temecula schools? And then that tells you, are they in Temecula schools? Are they in Murrieta schools? What are they open to? Are they relocating? So what you want to do is you want to start asking questions that are going to give you more information without asking a bunch of questions. Um, are you guys currently in Temecula School District? No, we're actually re we're out in Orange. But we're interested in Temecula School District. We also heard Murrieta Schools are pretty good, too. That's absolutely right. Okay, um, Most people right there will be like, well, how much do you want to sell your house for in Orange? I could do that. Relax. We wait till we get all the information, and then that's when we, get, we do all this stuff. Because people are terrified about talking about lending. And people are terrified about talking about their own house. They don't want to talk about those two things. That's why we wait until we have the information. Okay? So, um, who wants to role play with me? Who can, who can I hang out with? You want to do it, Jamal? Come on. All right. No? You don't want to do it? All right. No. Okay. got to do it. All right. Bring it up here. Okay. Jamal. Normally, I like to bring somebody up that isn't as handsome as I am, so I'm a little bit more comfortable up here. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so, um Beats. I, I gotta, I gotta get some beats on. All right. So, um, so what do you guys think? It was all right. It was all right. Yeah. Not exactly what you guys are looking for. Huh? Yeah, my wife's pretty picky. Yeah, pretty picky. Yeah. <laughs> She's got don't, your. Don't tell her. She's coming. <laughs> she got your run to the ringer a little bit. Uh huh. Okay. Uh -huh. So what, what's she looking for? Because she seems like she's um, a little bit more. Uh, she wants a big kitchen. Okay. She loves to cook. Gotcha. Um, she loves to cook. Why are you so skinny? Well, <laughs> you look great. Thank so, you. you guys have any kids? Any yeah. dogs? Uh huh. No, I hate dogs. I hate dogs. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll make sure that none of the dogs okay. convey yeah. any of the house. I thought I seen some pet hair, but it's fine. Okay. But, so, so you guys yeah, have, we have one kid. One kid. Eleven months. Okay. Uh -huh. A fresh one. Fresh uh -huh. one. God, fresh out the womb. Little okay. boy or little girl? 
little girl. Azalea. Azalea. Beautiful brother. I got goosebumps. Genuinely. Yeah. You can't fake that. Yeah, you do that. I love kids. Hey, he does. Okay. Weird. <laughs> See, yeah, it, it is. It's weird. But uh, so the thing is, is we're bonding right now. We're talking mm -hmm. about kids. We're, I, I want to hear what's important. In. My wife wants a big kitchen. Okay. Um, my, uh, I've got a little girl. Like these are the things that are important, guys. There's no scripting about this. It's just what's important. Period. We don't have to be weirdos about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so are you guys looking for a three bedroom? Or are you planning three, on having more kids? Three bedroom. Yeah. I know that's a personal question from somebody that you uh, just met. But you guys have more kids or what? Yeah. Okay, right on, brother. When? Okay. I don't. I don't Monday. Know. No, I said one day. <laughs> I'm not sure. Monday. Okay, so Monday you guys have more kids. No, one day. I know. I'm just giving you a hard time. Okay, so the more you're talking, the less they're talking, the more you're in control. You always want to give people the illusion of control. The illusion of control. Because that means that you can still take it away at any given point. Okay, the more you're talking, the less that they're talking in the beginning, the more that you're, you're bonding, you are driving the conversation. Okay, I'm in 100% of control of the conversation. Even though he's very funny and he's very interesting, he's somebody who's very much used to being in control of the conversation. Mm -hmm. He can walk out whenever he wants to, right? Unless I keep talking. Because he doesn't want to be rude, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so you guys are looking for at least three bedrooms, maybe four bedrooms. Are you open to a two-story or are you looking to keep it at a single story? No, we hate two-stories. Hate two-stories. Yeah. Okay, so we'll yeah. keep it at a single story. Uh -huh. Is a yard important to you? Uh-huh. Okay, so we're looking for a little bit of yard. Yep. And are you guys looking to keep it in this general area? Or are you guys open to Minifee? Winchester. No, not Minifee. Marietta Temecula. Marietta Temecula, no. rock and roll. And for, for the schools particularly? Because no. she starts school in six years. So I don't want to have a month. Yeah, yeah. No, just <laughs> get away from the family. Okay. All my family's in Minifee. All the family's in Minifee. Yeah. So keep your hops, skip it, and jump away from the yeah. family. Okay. And then uh, what, what price are you guys comfortable keeping it under? Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't really thought too much that, about this. Yeah, I'm not sure. What do you guys, so this says right just here. Just looking, man. Yeah, honestly. This right here. Says I, that he's probably doing what right now? Renting. Mm -hmm. Right? Are you renting? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for telling me that. I'm going to ask you that here in a second. Okay. So when somebody says to you, we're not really sure right now, that's a pretty good indication that they're renting. And if somebody is renting, that means that they're probably, or they went through losing their house, but because he's so young, that's probably not likely, but I don't want to know, so I'm not going to ask. Okay? We're actually going to avoid that question with the 10-foot pole. So when I ask, uh, so and that's going to come up after I get the information. So at this point, I feel comfortable in repeating back to him his information because we know that he wants Murrieta and Temecula. We know that he doesn't know too much about his budget, so this is an opportunity for me to educate him. So I say some things like, well, what are you guys currently paying monthly? Um, well, we live with our in-laws right now. So Saving a little bit of money. Uh -huh. Well, what are you guys comfortable spending monthly? Um, 1800 1800 okay. Okay, so right now I start thinking about areas that eighteen hundred dollars a month works. I start thinking about neighborhoods that that works in, and etc. Okay, um, so and then it's time to repeat back to him everything that he just said, repeating back to him his values while writing it down and not looking up. This is a presumptive close. Okay. This is because if you are sitting there and you're talking to somebody and the whole time that they're giving you information, you're, uh-huh, mm-hmm, okay. The second you take out your pen, what are they going to do? Walk out. Put their hands up. Thank you, Jose. Well, I'm getting ready to leave right now. I know this is Stay up here, young man. Okay. So when people throw their hands up, that is a very good visual indication that they've had enough. You've put them on, like, can you sign in? Oh. Okay, so I'm repeating back to him all of his information. He has his hands behind his back right now. That's also a visual indicator that he's a little bit uncomfortable right now. He's holding something back. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, so holding something back right here. Men, there's so many great body language cues. The other one is this. Suddenly everything about the roof becomes interesting when you're showing men houses. <laughs> Like they're like you're gonna find the answers up up there. Okay, so I repeat back to him all of these things that are important. Okay, um, what's your daughter's name again? Oh, Azalea. Azalea. Okay, like the um, flower. Beautiful girl. Okay, so okay, so we're looking for a single story home. Mm -hmm. You guys are looking to keep it in Murrieta and Temecula. Mm -hmm. We want to keep you guys away from the in laws out there in Menifee. Please. Uh, we're looking for a little bit of yards, a nice kitchen for your wife to do a little bit of cooking in, and then what's a good email for me to send these listings to? Ah, uh, I don't give up. Okay, what's a good phone number for me to reach you at? Uh, I don't give out my phone number. 
Okay. Um, well, see, what, what I've got right here is I'm I've got. My phone. Hey, brother. Well, yeah, no. Keep 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 <laughs> okay. with, with with that. Um, so I've got a seventy five hundred of the closest listings, yeah. and then what I've got right here is I have four single stories that are under three hundred thousand. Two of them are notice of defaults, and one is vacant. Go direct. We can I can actually show you this house at four o'clock today if that's something you guys would be interested in. It's a uh, eighteen hundred square feet. Mm -hmm. It's right here in French Valley. It was just listed nine days ago. Mm. Does this look like something, something you guys might be interested yeah, in? Yeah, maybe. Here. Let me call my wife from uh, here. Show upstairs. Her. Okay, cool. let her walk away from. Uh, let him walk away from it. He's not going to walk out of there with that with that mm -hmm. thing, right? Okay. Now that being said, when I have gone through this closing script and I've done the whole thing with the email, do you know how many times somebody has stopped me for an email? Do you know how many? Zero. It has never happened. It has never happened. People are so damn uncomfortable stopping me because I do such a good job with the presumptive close because I don't look at them. You're the first, even in role playing. Good job, sir. Okay, so when you get that email, and you're going to give me that email, uh -huh. I'm just going to have, I'm just going to make you. No, I would have it to you. So what you do is you get that email. You say, "What's a good email for me to send these listings to?" Do not look up. This is your Western standoff moment. What's a good email for me to send these listings to? And you bring the intonation down at the end. What's a good email for me to send these listings to? Too often, especially women, sound like they're taking orders at Jamba Juice, right? What's a good email for me to send these listings to? What's a good email for me to send They go up by the end. I'm telling you, I have changed women's entire careers over the course of this one conversation just by getting them to lower their intonation. Think of yourself as the professional lawyer. Think of yourself as the doctor. Think of yourself as the surgeon, as the attorney. A surgeon would say, would never say, so which foot do we need to operate on? Which foot do we need to operate on? It doesn't happen. Then she said, which foot do I need to operate on? Is it your right foot or your left foot? Is it your right foot or your left foot? So as you are practicing role playing with one another, you can put your hand up and drop it at the end. What's a good email for me to send these listings to? A good phone number for me to reach you at. Okay, the intonation is everything because you are telling somebody with a statement that they're going to give you their phone number and they're going to give you their email and you're doing it with a presumptive close and somebody will give away their email, for, say 33 cents on a gallon of freaking milk at CVS. They will give it to you to help you look for apps. Okay. All right. What's a good email for me to these listening to? Uh, Jamal, Sabri. Okay. And then and what's a good phone number for me to reach you at? Seven six zero. Okay. Five five five. Okay. Five. Okay. Um, and then can I text you this number? Sure. Look up at that moment. Your third question is the one that you look up on. Can I text you this number? That's when you give the puppy dog eyes. And I am telling you, about 15, 20 percent of the time, you're gonna get a bunk phone number, or you're gonna get a work phone, or you're gonna get a home phone, and then one hundred percent of the time. They're going to roger up and give you their cell phone number because they're so afraid that you're going to text them right there on the spot. I'm telling you. Okay? So, starting that over. What's a good email for me to send these listings to? Jamal Sabri. Okay, what's a good phone number for me to reach you at? Five, 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 five. Okay, and then uh, can I text you this number? Did hey, that works. You feel that? Can I text you this number? Yeah, sure. Okay, and then, uh, okay, then you establish expectations. Right here, establish expectations, establish boundaries. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a list of homes that fit your criteria tonight. If you can do it tonight, if you cannot do it to, to, till tomorrow morning, say tomorrow morning and then do it tonight. Under promise and over deliver. If you say I'm going to send you uh, listings before you even get to your car, brother, mm -hmm. and then by that night he still hasn't gotten an email from you. You stink at life. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you say, I will send you some listings tomorrow morning, if you see something that you like, feel free to mark the heart icon, we'll go take a look, and then you get them to them that night, you over deliver, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna send you some, email, uh, some emails, uh, some listings that fit your criteria. If you guys see anything that you like, feel free to mark the heart icon, we'll go take a look. Is that good? Yeah. Now he's thinking we're done. He's thinking we're out of here. Mm -hmm. We are not done, Dang. right? But what we did was, I got all of the information that I need, because we still have to talk about whether or not he has a house that he needs to sell. We still have to talk about the lender. Those are the two most terrifying questions that you do not want to ask people until you have their information or you will lose them. 
I guarantee it. Okay? Do you need to sell your house in order to buy? I just met you. Get the heck out of my face. Okay? That's one. The other one is, and I don't even remember what it is, but you don't want to ask that question either. Okay. So, so, and then what you do is once you have that information, you establish the guideline, and then you also establish your family time. Okay. So I'll send you these emails. Uh, if you see anything that you like, feel free to mark the hard icon. We'll go take a look. Just so that you know, I turn off my phone every night from 5 to 7.30 and all day on Sunday to spend time with my family. If you need to reach me during that time, I'll typically get back to you by 8.30. Does that cool. sound okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, brother. Um, so this is what I'm going to do. Um, are you guys currently renting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you guys currently renting? Yes. Affirming answer. If I said, do you guys need to sell your house in order to buy? you have a house in need to sell? No. Nope. No. That is not an affirming answer. That's a negative. And especially because we live in an area where so many people lost their homes. And you gave me everything you needed. I appreciate Thank Jamal. You. Thank you, brother. You want to Good job, Jamal! Oh, you can just take this. <laughs> so what you did was you got their phone number, you got their email, and you found out whether or not their phone number is something that you could reach them at, right? Now, most people at this point are going to say, do you have a house that you need to sell in order to buy? Back up a little bit. What we ask them is, are you currently renting? Because if they are currently renting and they say, yes, we are currently renting, that's affirming. That feels good. If they lost their house in 2008 or 2009, like so many people did, and you ask them if they're renting, that doesn't feel bad. If you said you need to sell a house and they lost their house, then they have to explain to you, oh, you know what? I actually lost my house. And then it becomes this uncomfortable thing. And then you have to spend three to five minutes telling them, hey, you know what? Everybody freaking lost their house in 2008, 2009. Don't worry about it. It is okay. It doesn't make you a freaking bad person. I will do everything that I can within my power to help you guys buy. I feel for you. I promise you I will do everything I can. Because I'm so emotional, I get caught up in stuff like that. It's better for me not to know. It's better for me not to know, and it's better for them not to have had to have told me. Are you guys currently renting? Yes. Rock and roll. Are you guys currently renting? No. We actually own our house. Well, hot damn. Fantastic. Okay. No, we actually own our house. Okay, cool. That's our. Would you guys need to sell your house? Would you guys need to sell your old house in order to buy a new home? Yes. Okay, cool. This is your favorite sentence that you guys are all. That's actually something we specialize in. And you're going to say that all the time to everybody about everything. Great. Well, that's actually something that we specialize in. What we can do is we can help you sell your old house and move directly to your new home without the layover in between. It's called stacking contingencies. And then that way you don't have to live with your mother-in-law or your friend or under a bridge somewhere. Does that sound good? Okay, cool. Word association. That way we can move directly from your old house into your new home without the layover in between. Does that make sense? Okay. We're looking to get yeses when we say things like, does that make sense? Does that sound fair? Because does that make sense is a question that we have all been programmed to say yes to from a very young age, even though it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Our teachers told us, does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Okay, then why did you get an F for a second time on biology? I don't know. Lay off of me. You asked me if it made sense while you were shaking your head yes and no. Um, okay, so there's that. And the other one is, is that fair? It doesn't have to get a, be a yes. It just has to be fair. Period. Okay? So, set up the expectation. Find out if they have a house that they need to sell. And then you can ask them about the lender. Are you guys currently working with a lender? No. Yes. Either way, it's the same response. Okay, great. Um, I'm comfortable working with whoever it is that you guys want to work with. But... I have a couple of preferred lenders that I work with that are great for the following reasons. If you would like, I could have them reach out to you on Monday. Would you guys like me to, to, if they could save you a little bit of money, would you guys like to have them reach out to you guys on Monday? Yes or no? And if they say no, that's okay. I will literally work with anyone and I will show anyone any property one time. Any series of properties one time. But I will not go out a second time without a, a pre-approval or a pre-call. Okay, so... Let's see if we got everything. Uh, information gathered. Okay, and then the number one thing that you are going to get, that your biggest objection that you're going to get for people that are talking to you about selling their house is, oh, we're just in the, in, uh, we're not really quite ready to sell just yet, though, because they want to go out and they want to look at an open house. 
they want to fall in love with something and then they want to go home and they want to relax and they want to kick around the can a little bit and just think about what they want to do. So this is what you're going to say. Oh, you know, I'm not really totally sure that we're ready to sell just yet. I completely understand. You guys are just in the information gathering stage, right? Okay. So what I can do is I can help you gather, gather all the information that you need so that you can find out what your house is worth, what I can do to help you sell it, and what you can net. That way you have all the information that you need so that you can make the best decision for you and your family, even if that's not the sell. I'm not going to hang out afterwards and park in front of your house for three days asking if you want to sell your house every 15 minutes. I'm just going to sit down with you for free, and I'm going to tell you what you can expect to make. Does that sound like, does that sound fair? Cool. So why don't we do this? How about Tuesday afternoon? I'll drop by your house. Cool. Two appointments. Your two appointments that you're offering every, every single person that walks through your open house is this. Today at 4 or tomorrow morning at 8.30. Because your job while you're at an open house is this. To schedule a freaking appointment for 4 o'clock that day or for 8.30 the next morning before your open house. Why? Because every single person that wants to buy a house actually wants to buy a house, believe it or not. They actually want to buy a house. So when they're going out and they're looking at open houses, they just haven't found the compelling reason yet. You just be good enough to give it to them. When is the best days to hold open houses? Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday, rock and roll, right? Traditionally, Saturday and Sunday. Is there a bad day to hold an open house? No. I don't know why no one has done this. I put this in my book, The Machine Gunner's Guide to Real Estate. Monday morning from 8 to 12, open open house. Hold it near a school and do it every Monday. What are you doing every Monday morning? Cold calling. Cold calling. What are you doing every Monday morning? Cold calling. Cold calling. Prospecting. You set up an open house. You're putting up open house signs at 730. You set up an open house at 8 o'clock. You're telling your entire community that you are out working every Monday when they are out working. Do they need to come into your open house? No. What? You're there dialing anyway. Your open house signs are up. You're branded. Your face, your sign, your number is all up. And they say, Jamal's out working every Monday morning. Every Monday morning when I'm out working, Jamal's out working. And what are you doing? You're making calls. You're trying to schedule appointments for that afternoon, for Monday afternoon, right? You're trying to schedule appointments for that weekend. You're doing that anyway. Why not do it while you're out holding an open house? Monday morning in the same neighborhood, every single morning, with people seeing your signs as they're dropping their kids off from school. Why not, right? That's my section on open houses. Any, any questions on open houses before I turn him loose for the second breakdown of the deal, which is scheduling the appointment? What would you do if um, a sign is That's a great question. Okay, so I'm fluent in Spanish? Really? Yes. Really? No, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking. I've been listening to a lot of Spanish hip hop lately. I'm hoping that I could pick up on some of it. <laughs> the game in Skrillex, bro. Okay, oh, don't look yeah. at me crazy. Um, so I'm just. I'm just giving you our time. No, no, I'm not giving you our time. I'm actually listening to Spanish hip hop. But no, that is. We'll talk about hip hop later. Okay, so listen. Um, what I want you to do is, uh, if if I don't have anyone that's speaking in Spanish, or that that is, what I'm doing right now is, well, what I was doing was I was sending them to a Spanish speaking person on my team. So do you want to join our team? <laughs> yes? Okay, cool. Let's make it work. So uh, so what am I doing with all my Spanish-speaking <clears throat> sp Spanish clients? I'm referring them to you. You fall? Of course. So uh, so that's what we were doing for a while. We had a really great uh, Spanish-speaking team, uh, well, husband and wife couple on our uh, team there for a while. Uh, they closed three, four escrows a month for a couple of months, and uh, and then they ducked out. So. If you want to close three or four escrows a month and then stick around and continue to close three or four escrows a month, I would love to have a Spanish speaking agent that sticks around for more than five minutes. So uh, we're here to grind. We're here to work. And if you want a whole bunch of people referring you business because they don't speak Spanish, then that's a great place to be. Did you think about your question, brother? No, it's just having to do with the Okay. We'll talk about <laughs> Yes. So sometimes with the number. Yeah. The way that you're going to find out if they give you a phony phone number is you're going to say, "Can I text you at this number?" And so, and I'm telling you, like, so then it, they can say yes, and then you text, and there's like, then you lost the lead. You didn't do a good enough job providing value at the open house to where they decided that they wanted to work with you. 
So they give you a crappy number. So like, so what you want to do is every single failure, you want to analyze that. You know what I mean? You want to look at it. Okay, I got a bunk number. What did I do? What was my breakdown? How did I fail this? You know what I mean? And just look at it honestly. If you got a bunk number, it's because you weren't providing enough value. But if you still got a bunk number, it's because they felt pushed enough to where they felt like they had to give you something, right? So um, if you start feeling like they're not going to give you that value, if they're going to lie to you, just understand that like you don't want to work with them anyway. You don't want to work with, they say buyers are liars, right? If you have one that's a liar out the gate, let them go. Would it be too much to say, hey, I'm just going to add my Keller Williams app. Yeah. Right now. I love the Keller Williams app. I think the Keller Williams app is phenomenal. I think it's a great excuse to text somebody right there on the spot. That's what I do sometimes, but sometimes you're like, oh, it's not getting the message. Mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, so sometimes I think, okay, I know, you know, I love that you did to me exactly what I would do if I was in the in the audience. You asked a question that you already had a better answer for. <laughs> <laughs> Rock and roll. So, so for those of you at home, what she's saying is she has the Keller Williams app, and then when she's confirming the the cell phone number, instead of giving uh, just talking to them randomly and saying, uh, "Well, hey, can I text you this number?" She actually says, "Can I text you the Keller Williams app right there on the spot to find out whether or not they're lying?" And then you're like, "You lying." My question was like, yeah. it, was, it was too much like to push in that, in that way. Like, say, hey, I'll send you my app right now. So, and your success push. will be defined by the number of awkward conversations that you're willing to have. I am 100% about making things awkward if you're comfortable with it. So, like, most people, like, some people might say, oh, that's uncomfortable. I don't want to find out if they're lying to me right down the spot. You're saying, oh, I, I, you're saying, I want to find out right there because otherwise I can't work with them. I'm saying, heck yes, do that. That's a great idea. There's nothing wrong with that. If you can sit, like, I would put that in the third thing. Can I text you this number? Okay, great. I'm going to go and I'm going to text you the Keller Williams app right now so that you can start looking for homes on your own. And then if you see something you like, you can just, yeah, just hit the icon. It's a great idea. What's your name again? Leticia. Leticia. Leticia, it's a great idea. Yes, ma'am. I love that you asked me that question. Because everybody just wants to show up, put a couple signs in the freaking front door, and then say, open houses don't sell houses. That's what lazy real estate agents say, okay? Open houses 100% do sell houses. Open houses get clients. So on a fused and reconstructed ankle, I would hang 400 flyers on Wednesday or Thursday. See, my goal was to book out my weekend by Wednesday. If I didn't have my Wednesday booked out, or my weekend booked out by that Wednesday at noon, I started booking an open house. I designed the flyers in my office. We were allowed a certain number of black and white flyers every year or every week or every month. And then what I did was I printed off black and white flyers. I cut them down halfway. And then that way I could fit 400 black and white flyers onto 200 pages. I would cut them down the middle. I would walk around with a backpack on my chest with the flyers right here and a stack of rubber bands. And I would staple a rubber band at the top of the flyer and put them on people's doors as I was walking because it's killing two birds with one stone. And then I would talk to anyone that wanted to talk to me about anything. You will 100% get referred to grandkids that way. 100%. <laughs> grandparents love me. And they love this guy too. But like when I'm out and I'm, and I'm talking to people, grandparents will talk to me and talk to me and talk to me. And I am 100% okay being grandma. Because grandmas are 100% more interesting than just about everybody my age. Seriously. Seriously. You talk to like an old guy about his life a little bit. He's just more interesting than anybody else my age. And then we're going to have a great conversation. And then he's going to refer me his grandkids. And it happens. It happened in my first month twice. While I was out holding. Because I, I opened seven escrows in my, in my first month. It would have been eight. But the other one was a new build and didn't close right away. Um, but two of them were from going around hanging open house flyers, and talking to a grandma. Actually, both of them were, were grandparents. Grandma talked to me about her kids, sent them in the next day. The other one was a house that needed to be sold in Corona. And he's like, hey, call my kids. OK, cool. Talk to people. Is there a specific time that you uh, passed out flyers? Um, Any time that you can make it work. Any time you can make it work. Um, I don't think there's a bad time to, to be out putting up flyers. There will be less people during the middle of the day. And if I'm being 100% honest, that's one of the reasons why I would go in the middle of the day because I am, 
I like to talk. You guys have figured that out. And so I will 100% be, it would take me like 15 hours to hang like three flyers if I end up running into two people. If I go like during like the afternoon when like people are coming home, my God, it'll just be a bad thing. So I have to wear my rollerblades so I go really fast. I'm just kidding. I don't really wear rollerblades. He, he, <laughs> okay. he does own rollerblades, though. I found them in his car. I have rollerblades, so. but with a fused and reconstructed ankle. It just doesn't happen anymore. So I'm, like, waiting for the day that my ankle can move again. What's up, Jose? So, uh, and then I'm going to be skating backwards. <laughs> What's up, Jose? When you're hanging those flyers, are you hanging them in the same neighborhood, or are you just taking it, taking it through the different areas to hang them out? Um, I just like to open up my car windows and just throw them out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, it's always for the places. So, um, the way that I thought about this, so people talked about, uh, oh, I do 10, 10, 20. Has anybody ever heard, heard of the 10, 10, 20 thing? I hang 10 flyers to the right and 10 flyers to the left and then 20 flyers across the street. So I was like, why would I do that when I could go 100, 100, 200? Right? So like if you're holding an open house for four hours, why not hold an open house for six hours. Why not? Everybody made fun of me in my first open house and said, are you going to bring a sleeping bag to your open house? <laughs> Man, what are you going to do? That's so stupid. You're going to be there all day. Okay, great. You know what else is stupid? Not closing an escrow your entire first year. That's stupid. Like if, if I hold a freaking six hour open house and I do it three days a week, 10, like, you know, 10 to four, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, how many times do you think that I had to do that before I had seven open escrows? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Seven open escrows. Because I worked. I worked. I held six hour open houses three days a week, and then I door knocked twice. I door knocked twice. And I ended up getting a listing that I ended up double ending at the open house. Like three weeks later. Your success will be defined by the number of awkward conversations you're willing to have. You just have to be willing to have them. People are going to treat you like a jerk. People are going to treat you like you're a freaking loser. People are going to treat you like a lot of different things. But the thing is, they have their own issues. That's why they're treating you like that. It has nothing to do with you. Any other questions before I turn it over to this guy? What's that? So I, when I was first getting started, I worked any, I actually, my first open house was a rental. I held open a rental. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, uh, and I ended up getting a lot of business from that rental. But the thing is, is like, just be there. Just have a door open. Your best bet for open houses are going to be vacant go directs. With a vacant go direct listing, it is like, so you can actually look it up and you can find out what's vacant and you can look it up in the showing instructions, what's go direct. And then that way, if it's vacant go direct, I know it's empty. And I know that the showing instructions are, I can show it at any given time. And so it's a much easier open house. You can also look at the first two letters, and if they're not SW for Southwest, then you know that it is an out-of-area agent, and they're more likely to let you hold it open because they're out in Orange County or they're in San Bernardino. If you don't know how to do those searches, get with us after, and we'll show you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so... On, uh, so Wednesday, I decide that I'm going to hold an open house. It typically takes about two or three hours, sometimes a final one, if you're being really passive about it. Because what do we do? We don't want to pick up the phone, so we text the, the, the person, and then we wait four, five hours, two days, six days, three weeks for a text message back from an agent saying, oh, my team's holding it open. Okay, that's what's going to happen if you text me. Because I don't, that's just, it's, that's just going to happen. It's not, it's not in the showing instructions. Pick up the phone and call somebody. Find out right away whether or not you can hold it open and then just move on. You will find an open house in 15 to 20 minutes, tops, especially right now in January. Nobody's working right now. You guys, the, the sooner you can get out and start holding open houses, the better. Because all the New Year's resolutioners are starting to wake up. Okay. I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to move on. One more question? Okay, good. No more questions. Hello, sir. What's up, devil? Okay, Zach Bach, second breakdown of the deal, phones and texts. David right. Tyson, something that's funny. People, people making fun of him for holding six-hour open houses. Realtors as a whole are always like, oh, God, I'm so busy. Realtors, I don't understand. It could be somebody that, that is literally brand new to the industry, and they are the busiest people on the planet. Does anybody notice that? 
Though we as realtors, I think we're busier than surgeons. We had, like there's doctors that work 24 hour shifts, but we as realtors are busier than them. When you talk to real estate agents, it's, it's a phenomenon. I don't understand how we all don't make $10 million a year with how busy all of us are. <coughs> uh, you set the appointment, you go through everything. Maybe you don't set the appointment. Maybe you go on the appointment with them and they you don't find them that house they're looking for. And so then what do you have to do? You have to do the dreaded F word. You have to follow up. Goodness, right? So I read a stat the other day, and I'm not going to quote it verbatim because quite frankly I don't remember it, but 48% of salespeople never follow up after the initial meeting. Less than 5% of sales are actually closed on the initial meeting. 80% of sales are closed between the 5th and 12th contact. How many people in here can honest to God say that if you call somebody three or four times that you continue to call them and leave messages? That's good. That's good. You know? And I bet you that those three people that just raised their hand are top producers. So follow up, the money is made in follow up, plain and simple. Um, my fastest escrow last year, I met them on a Sunday and I had them in escrow by Friday. Brand new client at an open house. That is an anomaly. That will happen once, maybe twice a year if you're consistently holding open houses. So don't wait for that to happen. I sold cars for a long time. And I always wanted to stand out on the point. I wanted to stand out outside, call the colors red in, black in, blue in, whatever. We didn't work off an up system. It wasn't around Robin. It was whoever was aggressive enough to be outside calling colors, right? So what did I do all the time? Stood outside, called colors. We called the dealership on Sundays because the receptionist wasn't there and it just rang the phone. We called the dealership from our phone to get all the other salespeople to run inside. So we're just standing outside and then we're the only one out there. We, we had a lot of fun selling cars. But I would stand outside. In the hot, the heat, the cold, the wind, the rain, it didn't matter. I was standing outside. What should I have done? Calling the people that already came in the freaking dealership. They already came in. They already expressed interest. I already know that they want to buy a car. And yet I have my little Rolodex thing with index cards in it sitting back there full of people that I should be calling. And I'm not because I'm dumb and I want to stand outside in Sacramento when it's 115 outside. It makes no sense. So... Follow up is key. If you haven't realized it, follow up is key. That is what we are doing every Monday and Friday out there and every Wednesday night. Follow up, follow up, follow up. We're holding each other accountable. Jose, I am holding him accountable. We were going through our leads the other day. I found it keeps the number keeps going up. I thought it was like 200. I think it's closer to 700. 700 leads that never got a phone call, never got an email, never got anything. And our ISAs have set 15 appointments in a week and a half. Sir. A lead that never got a phone. 15. That is the potential of somewhere in $150,000 in commissions in a week and a half. All because of follow up. So, first thing I'm going to touch on is the word okay. The word okay, I learned at Best Buy. I sold computers at Best Buy. I worked, uh, I almost went into the Geek Squad and I didn't, I'm not doing that, so I sold computers. Best Buy has one of the best sales training programs of any company out there. And one of the words that they teach is the word okay. You know, Jose, I know, I know you came in for, for a computer, but what you're telling me is that you, you kind of want a media center. So let's, let's go look at some TVs, okay? okay. Every time. Okay. Every, the sentence doesn't even have to make sense. Hey, let's schedule the appointment today, okay? Okay. Hey, I'm going to, you know, call me later, okay? Okay. They, they will say okay every single time. They'll always say okay. It's ingrained to us. So <clears throat> I wrote down two times. I don't know why I wrote down two times. Um, so, oh, appointments. So follow up, follow up, follow up. So you get somebody on the phone, right? And you're talking to them. Hey, Jose, this is Zach uh, with the team. I mentioned that open house a couple weeks back. Um, what, I know the, the, the house that we looked at wasn't quite the right fit for you. I found a couple of other houses that are exactly what you're looking for. I have today at 4.15 or tomorrow morning at 10.45 open for appointments. Which of those times works better for you? Tomorrow morning. Okay. Oh, oh you can't do today? Why not? Uh, kids have uh, support. Kids are, oh, what, what sports do you kids say? I didn't know that. Um, uh, wrestling and karate. Wrestling and because you have a son or a daughter, which does which? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have one of each. Oh wow! Okay. Which one does karate? Uh, my daughter. Okay. All right. That's good. What am I doing this entire time? Writing information. It, building a report. Exactly. What else am I doing? Because I'm on the phone. And I'm on my computer, right? It sounds kind of creepy to say document people's lives, right? But I'm building rapport, right? And how many how many clients does uh, Justin? How many clients do you have in your CRM? 
A lot. A lot. Probably, probably a few thousand. A few thousand. Do you remember every detail about every single one of those clients? When I read the notes, I do. When you read the notes, you do. And all of a sudden, it jars your memory of that person, that experience, the rapport that you built with them. And so don't be afraid to sit there and type stuff out. Now, if you're using a notepad because you're in your car or whatever and you're writing it down, be consistent. Later that night, set a reminder in your phone. Put stuff in CRM. I am so guilty of this of forgetting to do it. And then I will call somebody the next week and they're like, Zach, we're at Disneyland. We told you we were going to be at Disneyland. Yeah, I just want to see how it's going. Did you check out this ride? You might want to check this out. Go here for that. Provide value once you're on the phone. How many of you have called the check-in? Raise your hands. All of you have done it. I have done it. Called the check-in. Hey, I know you didn't. You said you're not buying for another six months. I just want to call and check in. Oh, uh, yeah, no, things are still not buying for six months. Cool, you know, just checking in. Thanks. What did you just provide? Nothing. No value. Quite frankly, you took from them. What is the one thing nobody can get more? Time. Time, right? You took their time from them without giving them anything in return, and they're not going to respect you if you do that all the time. So, if somebody tells you, how many people have had a client say, I'm not buying or selling in six months, and you call them in six months, and what happens? They already bought. They already bought. They already sold. Right? It happens all the time, and it's frustrating, but you just move on, right? So if you want to call them in two months, what do you need to do to call them? You have to provide value. You have to give them a reason. We are lucky enough that we do a bunch of community events. You know, we do one a quarter. So I can just call and say, hey, call them at our community event. Or call them to tell them something. Hey, the California Bureau of Real Estate just came out with this, and you know, I'm just calling people to let them know. Hey, you live in French Valley. Did you know about this event that's coming up? Or the parade of lights, or this, or that, or community events, home prices on the rise, blah, 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 blah. Provide value of some kind. Figure out what the value is. Okay, so I started carrying this planner around. I bought probably 50 of these, and I never use them, and they always end up going back. So, but I'm using this one. The reason is, is when you were at the appointment with David, you know, you're at the open house, David's at the open house, and he's talking to the person, he's setting an appointment. How powerful is it? When I open up, and I want to look like a professional, and I want to look like CEO, I open it up, and my calendar is full of stuff. Just writing all over this. What does this stuff say? Literally, Mondays, H12 calling. Wednesdays, 4 to 7 calling. Fridays, H12 calling. Gym, 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 gym. Like, make breakfast, right? They don't, they're not going to read what's on your calendar, and it looks busy, right? And so when you're setting that appointment after your open house, and you say, so I, my open house shuts down at 3 o'clock. I can show you houses today at 4.15, or I can do tomorrow morning at 8.45. Which of those times works better for you? Oh, those person works in 15-minute increments like a doctor. So they must be busy, right? And so a couple of things are going to happen. A, they're going to respect your time more because we are ingrained as a society that we show up 15 minutes early for doctors, for appointments, for stuff like that. And so when you work on the 15, people are more likely to show up and more likely to respect your time. Now, what happens when the person says, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I got to check with my significant other before I can commit to 10.45. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pencil in 10.45 tomorrow morning. Okay, I'm going to put that in my schedule because I want to reserve that spot for you. I don't want it to get full. If something changes, call me and let me know. If not, I'll see you tomorrow at 10.45. So one of two things is going to happen. They're going to show up at 10.45 or B, they're going to call you and let you know why they can't. And when they tell you why they can't, they're probably going to give you some insight into their life, which you are then going to write it down. Write it down. Because you're going to write everything down. So you talk to somebody on the phone and they say, hey, Zach, I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm not going to buy for four months. You know, some stuff changed in our life. What do we do in our CRM with that information? Set a reminder, right? You're going to put a reminder in your CRM. Who's guilty of not doing a reminder in their CRM? Me, right? Everybody is. You'll set a bunch of reminders like, I'm going to call this person in two months. And then the next thing you know, you're out showing houses and you're doing something, you're at sports, you're at the gym, the reminder pops up on your phone and you go, and you swipe it, right? And then it's gone forever. Don't swipe them. Leave them on your phone. Leave all those annoying notifications so when you're done doing what you're doing, you can get back to them. Okay, those notifications are important. They're there for a reason. They're like, they, that's that's $10,000 staring you in the face right there. Okay, so it's worth it. It's worth it to leave that notification. Use the calendar and schedule. Get off the X. Follow up a couple of times. So. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Money is made in follow up, plain and simple. You need to be emailing people value. You need to be emailing them what they're looking for. You need to be calling them and saying, hey, I found a house for you that fits exactly what you're looking for. This is it. Get them on the MLS emails. How many people have told their clients that the MLS emails are automatically sent every morning? No. Just tell them that the email is going to be sent. You know, hey, I'm going to set you up on the MLS. 
Every morning you'll get an email from me. If you see something that you like, click the heart icon, blah, 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 blah. And then you tell them, if you click the heart icon though, you need to call me or text me and let me know. So I can set an appointment to go see that house because the MLS doesn't notify me when you click the heart. That gets them calling you, gets them in contact with you. You know, have them have them save your number to their phone, all that kind of stuff. So who's got questions? Cool. That was easy. Any questions online? No questions no. online. Sweet. All right. Okay, cool. All right, so we've got the third breakdown right now. So, um, okay, so this is the, actually the easiest one, in my opinion, uh, but it's the one that people just absolutely mess up the worst. So uh, this is the, the way that I feel about people showing, uh, showing, showing listings. We just overcomplicate it. We give them way too much information. We want to make it the perfect experience for them, Perfectionism leads to procrastination, which leads to paralysis. Analysis is paralysis. So um, what I want you to do, and those are some handsome socks, Justin, um, is what do you give people when, when, when you take them out looking for a house? Can you put the third breakdown on there? Yes. What do you guys show people when uh, when you take them out looking for a house? What do you, what do you, what do you want to give them? What do you, what do you Value. What? what do you call this one? Third breakdown, closing the deal. Um, Everybody that I talk to, they want to give them the perfect buyer presentation. They want to give them the schools. They want to give them the tax rate, the payment. And what ends up happening is agents work way too much. I, one of my first managers told me, you should preview every listing before you go out there and take them. My God, talk about doubling your work unnecessarily. You, like, we do not live in a world anymore. In fact, we haven't in probably 15 years where you need to preview listings. Do you have a computer? Does anybody have a computer? <laughs> then you don't have to, then you don't have to, to, to go previewing listings. So this is what you're gonna do. You are not gonna give them a buyer's printout. The second that you give them a buyer's printout, they don't need you. You hold on to the MLS printouts that have all the information on it. Your job is to take the information you go out to show them, you say, hey, let's meet you, at the, I'm gonna meet you guys at the first property. We never do a buyer's consultation. If you do a buyer's consultation, you're telling them a lot of things that you can already tell them on the fly while they're looking for their compelling reason. So you go out, I typically like to show about eight to 12 open, or eight to 12 houses. Five is kind of a minimum. The reason is, is I like to get people to want to actually buy something that day. I don't wanna go out and just keep showing one property over and over and over again. If I'm gonna show one property, I wanna add two more at least. Otherwise, it's just kind of a waste of time. Okay, let's jump in. We'll just do some jumping jacks really quick. Okay, all right, here we go. So what I do is I give them the packet. When we go out and we look at houses, what are the weirdest houses to look at? Fizzbos, right? Fizzbos are weird. They're, the owner-occupied are weird, and the ones where people are in default are weird because in every single one of those situations, they're doing something for your clients that their client, your clients don't want them to do. They're either selling them something or they're selling them that they don't want them in, right? So what we do is we have to establish everything when we walk in. When I walk up, I hand them the business card. I say, whether it's a FISBO, a tenant, or anyone else, it doesn't matter. I don't want them to be walking through the house with us, right? It should take 15 to 20 minutes tops to walk through every single open house, or every single house, period. Whether it is, unless it's an estate or multi-residential, you should never take more than 20 minutes. Because your clients will do things like, oh, I hate everything about this house. Go grab the measuring tape. Let's measure every single room in here. You don't have that type of time. So say upward and onward. Upward and onward. Let's get out of here. You guys don't really like this house, right? Upward and onward. Don't do that about a house that they might potentially like. But don't dwell on houses that they don't want. Okay? When you show a tenant occupied house, when you show a FISBO, when you show a house that's notice of default, you walk in, you hand them the business card, you say, Hey, thank you so much for letting us come in. Are there any uh, rooms or closets that you guys don't want us to look at? Okay, cool. Why don't we do, we're going to go ahead and start in the kitchen. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. And then you're walking in and you are taking control. If you do not take control of that situation, they will take control of that situation and it will be as quick or as long as they want it to be. Okay. So set the pace. Your first house, typically your buyers are not going to be comfortable walking in, opening up doors, opening closets doing all the things that you need to do, so you have to do it, right? Um, you're going out, you're opening the doors, you're opening the closets, you walk out, and then you don't ask them anything on that first one, you get moving to the second one. 
You go into the second one, same thing. Hey, this house is 2,800 square feet. There's five bedrooms, four are upstairs, one are downstairs. Uh, and there's a pretty large lot in the back. The house has been listed for 28 days, so there might be a little bit of wiggle room in the price. Let's go ahead and take a look. You go in, you take a look, you come out. Now that you have something to look at, and you've had two or three, you say, okay, the first house. Uh, scale uh, from one to one to five. Five being the best house that you ever saw, Dad. What, what, what do you think? Three. Okay. Totally, totally average from Dad. What about you, Mom? What about you, Mom? What do you think? First house. Four. Okay, Mom likes the house. What about you, little miss? You're, you're, you're going to be the daughter in this in this equation. Yeah, we'll go back there. You seem to, Okay, what do you think, young lady? You love it. One to five. Five. Dad, she likes it. You might be overruled. Yeah. <laughs> what about the second house? Mom, what did you think about the second house, the green carpet house? One to five. Two. Two. Not good from mom. What about you, Dad? Whatever mom says. Whatever mom says. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Smart man, Jamal. What about you, young lady? What do you think about the green carpet house? You don't like green. Okay, great. So normally what we do is we want to have like two with us. And then as we go into the third one, we walk back out. Okay. Um, all right. Country kitchen house. Mom, did you like the country kitchen house? That was a five. That was a five from mom. Let's write it up. What about you, dad? Yeah, she said five. She said five. <laughs> dad, you're making it easy on me. I appreciate you. <laughs> Young lady, what did you think about the country kitchen house? You want a bigger backyard. So what do you think? One to five. Three. <laughs> I'll tell you what, young lady, she, she doesn't like it, but you know what? Mom and dad are still paying the bills for a little while. So you might be you might be SOL, young lady. All right. So here we go. The thing is, when you start talking to everybody, just start getting the idea from everybody. So ask the kids. The more you can get the children involved, the longer of a day that you will be able to have without the meltdowns. Am I right? As a real estate agent, your job is babysitter first. When you have the kids, real estate agent second. When I'm walking through, I have been pooped on, I've been peed on, I've had liquid on me that I don't know what the liquid is, and you just deal with it. Hello, young lady, how are you? Hello. Welcome aboard. Um, and so I walk through and I do the whole shebang, and, uh, and I show the properties, and then I go through and it's one to five, one to five every time. As you're walking through, what house did we not like? We didn't like the green carpet house, right? So we, Crystal? Yeah. I didn't even recognize you. Holy smokes. <laughs> you, you did something different with the hair. It went darker. Yeah. So Crystal is the newest person on our team. <laughs> you can tell that I've stepped back a little bit as the sales team lead. So Crystal, uh, Crystal's here from our team. Jose is here from our team. And uh, and then we've got a couple more people that are hopefully going to be joining our team by the, by the end of the session here. So when we walk <laughs> through, uh, we always want to keep it at two. So if there's a third one, and remember, which one did they not like? Yeah. Green carpet house. We're getting rid of it, right? We're folding up. Okay, so hey guys, we really like the country kitchen house. We really like the house with the big backyard. Let's go. Ahead. What do you guys think? Let's, you guys want to throw this one out? Okay, cool. Let's throw it out. And then we're folding it, and we're either throwing it in the back seat or whatever it is happening. It is no longer in that stack of papers. Okay. Fourth house, fifth house, sixth house. You do the same thing. Process of elimination. That way, you're not sitting there at the end of the day and handing them a. 12 pieces of paper and saying, here's every house that we saw today. Now go feel extraordinarily overwhelmed by all of this information and not write an offer ever while you and I are working together until we both get frustrated and you walk into Zach's open house and buy it. Ah, okay, it's not that bad. All right, so when you walk through, you're dwindling it down. Now, I love for the last, the last listing to be vacant if it's possible. If it's not possible, that's okay, okay? Because what room of the house are we all making the decisions in? The kitchen. I love like the chorus of women that came from the back. The kitchen! <laughs> That's absolutely right. The kitchen is the house that we were making the decision in. And who is making the decision? The wife. The wife. Period. Unless you live in one of those three weird backward states in America where they're selling moonshine to each other, women are making the, the decisions when it comes to real estate. Okay? Um, you know what I'm talking about. That's a weird show, right? <laughs> <laughs> like they're like like breaking federal laws on television. Something's not adding up. Okay, so anyway, um, you're going out, you're showing the properties, you go to the last one, you go through the kitchen, you've got the two that are your favorites, country kitchen house and large backyard house. 
and name them just like you would on HGTV because that's what everybody wants to do anyway. Name the house. It doesn't have to be, oh, um, did you guys like the pristine flooring house or the beautiful kitchen house more? Are you kidding me? Just say green carpet house. Just whatever it is that the wallpaper house, whatever it is that they hold on to is that distinct reason. Write that information down. While they're saying things, write down everything that they're saying. Not everything. Don't be weird about it. But if they're like, oh, I didn't like how small the yard was. Okay, mom didn't like how small the yard was. You know what? I didn't like that. I couldn't see the backyard from the kitchen. Okay, she didn't like that she couldn't see the backyard from the kitchen. If, they didn't, if they're leaving the house that they are selling because they can't see the backyard from the kitchen and they're getting to write an offer on a house where they can't see the backyard from the kitchen, do you think you might want to pump the brakes? Okay, just tell them. Remind them what their compelling reason is. They will thank you for it. You say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm just going to throw this out there. This house has the same type of kitchen as the one that you're leaving. Do we really want to write up, up an offer on this house? And they might say, you know what? It has everything else that we're looking for. Let's do it. Or they might say, you know what? You're exactly right. Let's keep looking. Okay? I would rather them not hate the house. The right one's out there. Okay, so you get down, you dwindle it down. You've got the two, the country kitchen house and the freaking big backyard house. We walk into that last house, and then what do you say? So what'd you think? So what'd you think? Mom, one to five, this is the last house. What'd you think, Mom? Four and a half. Four and a half. Mom, you're very generous. You might be the most generous buyer that I've ever worked with. What about you, young lady? Four. I don't even think I'm going to ask you again, Dad, but what did you think about this house? I like it. You like it, yeah. but not as much as the last house. Yeah, because you started I, off with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dad's well, tired. I mean, do you need a nap, Dad? Yeah, I do need a nap. <laughs> okay, nap time for Dad. Yeah. Which one was your favorite? Uh, the one we just left. Okay, because I want I, I want to let you know uh -huh. that you and I both know that she's making the decision and everything like that. But mm -hmm. you're, yeah, I know you're important to me, Dad. Mm -hmm. You're important to me. I'm, I'm thinking about you. I just want to let you know that, okay? Don't let dad fall through the cracks, okay? A lot of people do that to dad. They just say, oh, well, we're making the decision. You're just stupid. That's how we treat men in this society a lot of times. We're making the decision. Go away. That's not really fair, right? So what I like to tell him, I say, hey, you know what? She's making the decision when it comes to real estate, but I'm going to work my butt off for you, Dad. You know what I mean? I'm going to do everything that I can for you. You're not going to be forgotten about here, okay? But who, are, who am I working for? Her. Who's telling you? Just the truth. Okay, so you walk through, and what you want to do is you want to dwindle it down to two. You want to dwindle it down to two, okay? So the last one. Okay, so you guys want to, you guys want to get rid of the one, what, what do you think? Probably get rid of the first one? Or you guys like this one better, Mom? You like this one better or do you like the first one? Okay. What about you? First one. Okay, Dad didn't like this one. This wasn't Dad's favorite either. So, okay, you know what, guys? We've seen we've seen 12 houses today. Everything's kind of starting to blend in together. Um, and then this is where you go into the, 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 the line. So why don't we do this? And then you act like you're coming up with it on the spot. So why don't we do this? We've seen a lot of houses together. together um, so why don't we do this? Let's go back. Why don't we take a look at the, these two houses one more time? I'm going to call the, the agent on the way there, see what I can do about getting us in there. And then that way everything's fresh in our mind. What do you guys think? You want to go take a look one more time? I can do it. I can make it work. Because nine times out of ten, they feel bad because you've already seen 12 houses with them. They're here to make a freaking decision. They don't want to go home not knowing. I'm telling you. They just don't want to. They want to double back and they want to look again, but they don't want to ask you for it or they're not willing to consider it, okay? So why don't we do this? We've seen a lot of houses today. Let's go back. Let's look at these two, and then I'll call the agent on the way there. And You want to tell them, I'll call the agent on the way there. I'll get us in. We'll figure it out. You guys want to go take, a, take another look? And then as you're saying, do you want to take another look? All of the things that you've unloaded onto the kitchen counter, the two flyers, your keys, your wallet, you're picking them up and putting them in your pocket. I know that sounds intense, but it's like, all right, let's go. You're wrapping it up. Okay, cool. So why don't we do this? Um, we've seen a lot of houses to get together today. We've got two houses that are your guys' favorites. Let's go back. Let's take another look. I'll call the agent on the way, and then uh, make sure that we can get in. Sound good? 
They want to do it. You go back. What is the number one issue driving back to that house? What's the number one issue? Can't get a hold of the damn agent, right? Mm -hmm. Can't get a hold of them. Why can I not get a hold of them? It's probably freaking dinner time. They're probably with their family. That doesn't mean that we need to start crapping on this agent and talking about what a terrible agent they are. We just go up and we knock on the door. You hand them a business card. If I walked up to a, a person's door and I knocked on the door and said, hey, I'm so sorry that I'm bothering you. My clients are actually out there in the car right now. We saw this house two hours ago and we have dwindled it down between this house and one other house. Can we come in and take another look for about 10 to 15 minutes? I'm so sorry. Even if they're in it, they're going to let you in because people know what it's like to get excited about something. They want you to come in. If they're a homeowner, even freaking better. If it's vacant and you got a freaking, it's better for forgiveness than permission, right? Hello? I'm so sorry. I'm coming in. Is anybody naked? <laughs> don't ask that. Don't ask that if you're a guy, especially. <laughs> if you're a girl, don't ask that either. Don't ever ask if anyone's naked. But, but like, like, that's what you want to, don't shoot me. I'm coming in. Go in, double back, see it again. Now, you go back to the second house. What you're doing is this. This is your clothing line. Okay. What do you guys think? That's it. It's not, so what price did you guys want to come in at? What price did you guys want to come in at? Which one of you? It's none of that. You don't have to. You did your job. If you're going back and you're saying, so what did you think? And you're rolling out the two, the two listings for them to choose between, and neither one of them are it, what do you think you need to do? Change it up. You're going out again. But if you slide out those two listings to them and you take a step back and then dad and mom start talking and then they start looking back through the house and they start figuring out what rooms are going to go to what kid, the offer's already written, right? The offer's already written. It's already happened. Because you gave them what? A compelling reason. Okay? We get too caught up in not giving them their compelling reason. You give them their compelling reason, everything else is history. Now it's a matter of what you want to come in at. Well, what have we been in for the last four years? A freaking seller's market, am I right? Does it look like it's going to change anytime soon? Probably not. Okay? If the, if the house has been on the market for less than two weeks, you're probably coming in and asking. If it's been in the market for more than two weeks, you might be able to come in 10000 under or ask for closing costs. You can do these kind of things with them. Then talking about the offer is no big deal. Talk about the details later. All you're doing is finding out which one they want to come in at. So what do you guys think? Okay, cool. All right, well, that, okay, cool. So you guys like this one? Yes. All right, rock and roll. Well, I'm going to go home. I'm going to pull some comps, and uh, we'll get an idea about whether or not it's priced where it, it, it is. I'm telling you right now, though, it is a seller's market. Start setting up expectations. It is a Monday. There's a good chance that there might already be offers in. So it's been listed for us in two weeks. We're going to want to probably come in strong if we come in. Um, so I'm going to go pull comps. Cool? I'll give you guys a call in about an hour, hour and a half. Sound good? Go home. You're writing me off. Here. Three breakdowns of a deal. Open house. You got the scripts. Booking the appointment. They're not a client until you get them out the door. And then the third one is writing the offer. When you're sitting down with your teams and you're asking them these questions, your job as a team lead is to find out what their breakdown is. If they have a, whole, if they have a huge book of business, but they can't get anyone out for an appointment, their breakdown is number two. If they can't get anyone's information at an open house, their breakdown is number one. If they've got a huge book of business, they've got appointments all the time, but they can't get people to write offers, their breakdown is number three. Literally, the only three things that stand in the way between an agent getting paid and not getting paid, the three breakdowns of the deal. Questions. When did I sign with the BRE? What do you mean? BRA. Oh, the buyer representation agreement. Okay, um, so I have never had a buyer sign a buyer's representation agreement. Um, I got burned in my I got burned three times in my first year. Two of those times were by a Marine. By a Marine. Who had it, then wrote it up with a brother, wrote it up with a cousin, and then the other person was a biker who loves Marines. So it's never a good indication that somebody is not gonna screw you over. 
because of how loyal they are to you or how perceived loyal they are to you. Um, I do not have buyer sign rep- representation agreements to you. Nope. I have a different. I have a different mindset on it. Open. So my mindset on, on BRAs is if I am not providing enough value as an agent and they choose to go work with somebody else, that's not me getting burned. That's me not doing my job. If I am not providing enough to those people that they feel like they need to come back to me, then that is my fault. Uh, bro, it's something I, I think that they teach the new hires. Oh, is it? I don't know. The thing is, it, it's not going to hurt. I just have a, I have a mindset of holding myself accountable for it. Um, I never have had somebody do it, and to me, it's an accountability thing with me. So this is the way that I've heard of people doing it in the past on other teams that where they're successful is people will uh, they'll take them out um, and I don't know how we're doing it at Keller Williams but they'll take them out they'll show them properties that first time and then at the last house or like somewhere in the middle they take out the buyer's representation agreement like if you're showing eight houses taking it out at the fifth house and they'd be like oh hey guys I I forgot about this um, my brokerage actually requires and if they require it then just do it like this. My brokerage requires, because we are commission only, that if you are going to be working with me, that you give me some sort of a commitment saying that you are going to be working with me, especially if I show you a house that you end up buying. So I've drafted a buyer's representation agreement for you saying that if you buy one of these houses that I show you today, that you will indeed work with me. So if you could go ahead and sign it, I put the MLS numbers for all of these houses in here. Every time that we go out, you'll be signing one of these with me. Does that make sense? Then you just, that makes sense? Okay. Yes, that makes sense. Okay, and then they'll sign it. I could get anyone to sign anything for me. Um, I could probably get somebody to sign over half of their children. Did. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. But the thing is, you just have to be able to believe that you can do it and believe in the value in it. Because a lot of times where we get tripped up is the value. And if what you have to remember is, in order for me to be able to com- fully commit to you, I just need a partial commitment from you. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but like I hate that. You look like you have an answer for that. Hey, Mahasa, I just had a quick question for you. And I think that maybe you could shed. So, what what is the policy here on uh, BRAs, buyer representation agreement? Well, it's the standard for all of our agents to, to get a Okay, is there a requirement on when you have when you have someone sign that? As soon as you see them, as soon as you meet them, okay, and they agree to work with you. So, okay. we don't want you to work at Uber, right? Yeah. And then for for the, like, the buyers. Is there any issue with like if you were to go out and show eight properties? With going out with the eight properties on the BRA on there, and then saying, in order for me to show you all these properties that we have scheduled today, I just have to have you sign this buyer's representation agreement. So, yeah, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it because cover yourself. That could save yourself lots of time and headaches. Yeah, and thirty thousand dollars, like what happened to me in the first year. Yeah, it's it's not required for par for BRE. This isn't something. This is this isn't like the RPA that you have to have it. But it's, it's not, why not have it? You have an uh, RLA sign. You yeah. sign the, your, your, the listing agreement. Why not the Okay, cool. Well, there you go. So, so uh, not required, but encouraged. 100% and encouraged. 100% encouraged. And like I told you, like I would have gone from 126000 my first year to 156000 had I had people sign the BRA. Um, yes, ma'am. The well, PCA. Okay. Okay. Office. And if you guys have any questions at home, too, fire those away. But I also think that if you make them sign a paper, if they don't want to work with you, like, so, so like, like Zach said, Zach has never had anyone sign a BRA. I've never had anyone sign a BRA. And so we're just kind of walking people through it. Uh, so this is the thing. If you don't want to have ever have anyone sign a BRA, Mahasa will probably tell you, don't have them sign a BRA, but you're going to lose money. And I'm going to tell you that you probably will lose money. But the thing is, is uh, um, 
you don't have to have someone sign a buyer's representation agreement for a period of time. Like you don't have to put 180 days on it. You could literally have it just for the properties that you are showing them. I see no problem with that whatsoever. If you're showing them nine properties and you want to put nine properties on a VRA and you just say, this is only for the properties that I'm showing you today. If you guys want to work with me, I'm not going to show you a house and then not, you know, and then not work with you on it. So if you guys are willing to give me that courtesy as an agent that's working 100% on commission, then I'd love to take you guys out today. Um, if not, go away. I'm just kidding. But then it's, it would be like, they don't want to work with you. So, but, but, but so, so this is the thing. There's two things that are happening right now. And we're, we're going to move on from BRA here after this question. Um, you don't see the value in the BRA because you're nervous about having them sign it because you think that it might scare them from working with you, which is fine. Okay. So then you either need to see the value in the BRA for you and for them, or you need to never ask someone to sign a BRA. Because if we ask people to sign things that we don't believe in, they're going to pick up on that crap and they're never going to work with us. Yeah. Just on, on top of that, just be okay then with getting hurt. Yep. Yeah. Like yeah. Be okay with it, you know? Do you have clients sign a BRA? I always do. I you do. Before I came to CW and just coming to CW, I, I always, and I think it just brings, um, Great value because it does show that you know you are a professional. Just like she said, if I have them sign the listing agreement, yeah, then I have expectations for the BRE. And okay. Shows their commitment. To sure. Okay. okay. So we've got some some uh, some conflicting things here in the room. Some people are uh, love the BRA. Other people do not. What about you, Justin? I was gonna say I don't sign them. You don't have it? I'm a handshake guy. If you're going to leave me, you're going to leave me. But my, one of my listings, for instance, I put on them right there on day one. You may cancel this listing at any time for any reason without penalty. Yeah. I give you an out on day one because, in my personal opinion, if you've got a BRE and they want out of it, are you going to get in a silly argument over a $10,000 commission having to go bad not be everywhere on mine? They'll stick forever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's one way of thinking about it, and I, and I have a feeling that she would disagree with you. No, no, no. Uh, there's but, pros, there's yeah. pros to it, definitely. <coughs> but I think if I'm giving you the value that that I should be giving you, you're not going to walk away from me anyway. So if you do, then you won't commit to me. Well, these things value. You can get people to sign anything. Did you end the broadcast? Did you end the broadcast? No. The comments just aren't popping up. I don't know why. So you can get people to sign anything as long as you are providing value. And you have to believe that, you know, we are not, We I call us salespeople all the time. We're salespeople, yes. But on a higher level, we are fiduciaries. Has anybody looked at what the little thing means? It's the same as an attorney, for Christ's sake. You know, and if you look at this person and say to them, this having this signed agreement allows me to protect your interest as a real estate agent. It allows me to negotiate on your behalf and to make sure that you are taken care of through a transaction. All right. You so know, so you let's move on from the BRA. Yourself. What other questions uh, do you guys have about real estate, the buyer's representation? Or not? Jeez. Goodness gracious, I can't even move on from it. What other questions do you guys have about real estate, three breakdowns of a deal, anything like that? Just a question for you. Um, I, I see this often where I'm helping a client, I'm selling their home, we get multiple offers, we go into escrow over asking, and then all of a sudden they want to write offers and they want to write in 10, 20, 30, 40, under. Yeah. How do you get around that? Okay, so I just throw it right back at them. I, tell, I literally remind them of what their process was like. I say, okay, we either have a buyer's market or we have a seller's market. And I am one of the best agents out there on planet Earth, and I'm going to do the best I can, but typically you're going to get hosed on one end or the other. You're going to get hosed selling or you're going to get hosed buying. And what we can do is we can find properties for you that are going to be less competitive, but they're also going to be less desirable. In a seller's market, the reason why is that a seller's market is the seller has the commodity just like you did with your house. So you need to understand that in order to come in, you're going to have to be competitive. And if that means paying $10,000 more and actually getting the house that you want, is that worth $60 more a month? If it's not, tell me. And then what we'll do is I will absolutely 100% go digging for deals for you. We will go dumpster diving and I'll find you some gold, brother. We'll polish it up. But the thing is, is if it's worth $60 a month to get the house that you want, I want to have that conversation at the house. If that's something you're open to having in a seller's market, we'll rock and roll with that. But the thing is, we might walk out and it might be 80 days on market, then we can undercut. It all depends on the price point, of course. It all depends on the market. And it all depends on freaking when it hit the market and all that different stuff. But I always bring it back to $10,000 a month. comes out $10,000 over the course of 30 years comes out to about $60 a month. Are you guys willing to lose it for $60 a month? And if you are, that's fine with me. I'm 100% okay with that. 
I just want to make sure that you are. Other questions? Crystal? <laughs> Anybody? So you did open houses on Monday um, around the schools in the same area. Yeah. Because your your mentality is that all the, all the stay-at-home moms that are going and dropping their kids off may potentially pop in. Well, who else is driving to work at that time? It's not just about stay-at-home moms. So the thing is, if, I, if I'm holding an open house during the week, it is with the understanding that I am there to freaking work. I am on the phones, either call, cold, cold calling expires and FISBOs, or I am calling my book of business. My book of business is so fat that I would never have to call cold call and expired or a FISBO or anything like that. I would just call up everyone whose lead I already have. Whatever, this is my biggest pet peeve on planet Earth about open houses. I hate it when people tell me, oh, it was a boring open house. It was a boring open house. The open house isn't boring. You're boring. There's always time to work. There's always something that can be done. When I first got started in this gig, it, like I was like, who can work 40 hours a week in this job? It's almost impossible to stay busy. No. Who can work less than 40 hours a week in this job? Who can turn it off? It's so hard to turn it off for me sometimes because there's just like, be, be, being able to practice real estate is like having a license to print money. It really is. It's like having a license to print money. If I wanted to make a million dollars this month or this year by being a solo agent, I could do it. But I hate working as a solo agent. I love being on a team. I love managing and training people. But if I wanted to be a millionaire this year, I would just fire everybody on my team. I would work by myself with one assistant and a transaction coordinator. And I would make over a million dollars this year. But I'm not interested. I'm still paying for my groceries and they're still being, I'm able to take them home with me. I haven't had to turn in, I haven't had to give back groceries at the, the checkout clerk uh, in a freaking hot minute. So the thing is, I grew up poor. I grew up in Section 8 housing. I grew up uh, raised by a single mother. Money is not a huge motivating factor for me. What is a huge motivating factor for me is helping people that don't understand how to make money, how to make freaking money. I'm really good at that. I've helped you know six people on my team make over $100,000 that had never made a dime in real estate before. I'm just good at helping people make money. So that's what I like doing. That's what's rewarding for me. And because of that, I'm able to spend that 50% of the time that I have my kids with my kids. So it's all about priorities. You want to make a million dollars, rock and roll. This guy, you're in a freaking room with a, a guy that can help you do it. Um, other questions? Cool. I appreciate you guys sitting here for like three and a half hours or however long it's been. What time do we end up having? Only hour and a half. Hour and a half. Wow, we spent through it an hour and a half? So we have never done that before. This class is normally three to three and a half hours long. So we, we kept it really short. Um, I'm going to check to see one, one more time if anybody has questions at home. We're going to end the broadcast here in a moment. We'll stick around here for about 10, 15 minutes. Oh, one other thing that I want to tell you guys about. I'm going to speed you guys through my books really quick. Read How to Win Friends and Influence People. Literally my favorite book on planet Earth, How to Win Friends and Influence People, is 100% the way that I started doing my business, how I started running my business, walking up to somebody and saying, how can I help you? How can I help you in your business? You know what I mean? How can I help you? Like that is more appealing than walking around thinking about how I can help myself. The millionaire real estate agent. Who has read this? Who has not read this? Who wants to read this? I want to read it again. Huh? I'm kidding. I don't Do you have it? No. You can have that. That's my copy. Um, that's the only one that I'm going to give away because I have three of them. Okay. Uh, 48 Laws of Power. Guys, this is one of the most heinous books out there. 48 Laws of Power. You will absolutely feel like you have to take a shower after reading this book. These are all the rules that everyone is playing uh, with in a powerful position that we are not playing by. Right? Things like never outshine thy master. Freaking always say less than necessary. Uh, never put too, too much trust in, in, uh, in friends. Learn how to use enemies. This is like just awful, awful stuff. But it's written by this guy named Robert Greene. Um, you could listen to him on Bulletproof Radio as well. Excellent podcast. 14 Laws of Power. Um, Einstein, his life and universe. He's an INTP. I'm an ENTP. Anybody? Big Myers-Briggs test people out there? Okay, Myers-Briggs is the forefront of human of the human brain. 
There are two last great frontiers, space and the human brain. Okay, we are 100% untapped up here. Paying attention to people like Einstein, paying attention to people like Tesla, paying attention to people like this will change everything for you if you just learn how to think, which is a lost art in this country. We stopped learning how to think a long time ago, the second that we became so reactive and stopped reading books. Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl Strayed. tough time in your life right now this is beautiful beautiful stuff she was a self-help columnist there for a while um dear sugar read a book if you ever feel like you have like there's something going on in your life that you can't get through read a freaking book uh joseph campbell reflections on the art of the living if you are a uh, an enfp you probably already know who joseph campbell is um the alchemist anybody read the alchemist yes ma'am yes ma'am the Alchemist, good stuff. Uh, before you get married, read The Alchemist. Before you do anything, read The Alchemist. The Ar huh? What was that? What do you read after? What do I read after? Uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. <laughs> the Five Love Languages. And the um, Art of War. And The Art of War. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Art of War. Either read The Art of War um, or you will, you will work for somebody who, who read The Art of War. Um, it's one of those two things. Uh, and that is it. The art of war is good stuff. I really like this version. Any sort of version where you can get uh, commentary on it is good stuff. If Congress or Senate would read the art of war, we would have less of it. True and false by David Mamet. Um, this is, uh, hearsay and common sense for the actor. Read true and false as a think of yourself as an actor on the phone. Think of yourself as an actor at the open house. This is good, good stuff. He did a whole bit here about um, how we are a generation that would like to stay in school. David Mammon, good stuff. Um, Living with a Seal by Jesse Itzler. Um, Jesse Itzler, uh, his wife, you guys know Spanx, right? So his wife did Spanx. He owned like a private airline company. Um, I say white rapper. He was a white rapper, like he was able to change his skin tone at some point or another. But uh, he's got, he was a white rapper and uh, he lived with a Navy SEAL. He found a Navy SEAL. Um, this is great. He, he found a Navy SEAL and he said, will you come live with me for 30 days and train me for 30 days? And so this Navy SEAL shows up at his house by the freaking, I think it was like the Great Lakes or something. And like they bust out the side of the water with with uh, with freaking uh, like a hammer or whatever his hand or and they jump in the freaking lake, and then the, the guy says jump in, and then when he gets in he goes okay now you're gonna have to take off your socks, and you're gonna have to put them on your hands, and then you're gonna have to put your hands on your arms so that you can get out so that your arms don't stick to the ice. He says if you put your arms on the ice, there's nothing that I can do to help you. There's nothing that anyone else can do to help you. You will probably die of hypothermia. Yeah. Right? Shattering your baseline. Whenever we, get, we work out with somebody, we always want to work out with somebody who's shaped like us. We always want to work out with somebody who's shaped a little bit worse than us. We forget that accountability partners should work harder than us. We forget that accountability partners like Jamal that actually show up Monday morning at 8 o'clock, that's who your accountability partner should be. You know who I, who I got a Facebook message from on Saturday. Hello, how are you? all? So are you coming in to make phone calls? Come with me. I can't just yet. Yes, you can. Ron Forrest needs you right away. I can't just yet. Can I'm live. So, so I'll, I'll have to go with you in a little while. Okay. Um, so Living with the Seal by Jesse Isler um, is a fantastic book, and it will teach you how to shatter your baseline. Try. Damn. If you are a veteran... Read Tribe. If you want to understand a veteran, read Tribe. If you want to understand why you feel so disconnected from things that are going on in the West, why you feel so alone, read Tribe. A tribe is a group of people that you would feel compelled to share the last of your food with. True Believer, just if you're a nerd and you want to read about history, this was a self educated longshoreman. Um, wrote about the true believer. It is a study of the the um, 
rising of the proletariat. Uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany, um, study of Russia, a study of freaking France, and it was written by a self-educated longshoreman. Radical acceptance, uh, embracing your life with the heart of the Buddha. Uh, there is an acceptance to Buddhism that you're not going to find in Western religion. Um, we, I have done wrong. I will do wrong. There's nothing wrong with doing wrong. Everyone makes mistakes. Getting over it, accepting who you are so that you can practice real estate effectively, radical acceptance. Accept who you are with the heart of the Buddha. And then after you get done reading about radical acceptance in the heart of the Buddha, read somebody cussing every other word with Gary Vaynerchuk. Ask Gary V. Um, I'm going to show up right now. Okay, so we're going to we're going to kill it right now. Um, I, I apparently got to go talk to somebody about something that's important. Um, so that's it. Any other questions? Feel free to stick around with Zach. I'll be back here in about ten minutes, but I got to go talk to somebody. Thanks, guys. Thank you.